Good evening, everybody. It is great to be with you all here on a live edition of Friedman Adventures here from 22nd Street Landing in beautiful San Pedro, California. Steve is here. Alex is here. Kim is here. And Mark Paisano Jr. Mark, it's really great to see you and great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me, Phil. <clears throat> how's everything going with the boat? I'm going to thank some sponsors, but just real quick, how's it going? Is it going pretty good? Because you guys are working your tails off down there. Yeah, it's going. It's going uh, semi-smoothly. Uh, I'd like to be done by March 1st, but that's unrealistic. That's and a not pipe dream at this point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so uh, we'll be done by April 1st, hopefully. That's the kind of deadline we set. All right, well, perfect. We're going to talk to Mark about the upgrades they've done to the Amigo. We're going to talk to him about the coming season. He's got his finger on the pulse of sport fishing, so he knows all about the squid and everything else and what that means for the future. But first of all, let me thank a few sponsors. And, of course, we'll start right here at 22nd Street Landing in beautiful San Pedro, California, where you can jump on board the Amigo with Mark this season and have a really great time. They've got half-day boats, three-quarter day boats, overnight boats, really a great place in beautiful San Pedro. Daiwa is our rod and reel sponsor. You can see them over my shoulder. Whether you're fishing big game or the surf, bait casters, whatever you need, Daiwa can take good care of you. Opsin Fluorocarbon, our good friend Greg Brown over at Opsin is working his tail off to provide you with a product that is second to none. Opsin Fluorocarbon, www.opsinusa.com and put F-A in at checkout. You'll get a gift. CCA also is a big sponsor of ours. They're doing great stuff in the industry and keeping fishing open for all of us. And I want to mention Ventura Sport Fishing. Tucker McCombs, great guy. And they've got not only the Endeavor up there where they do all that great overnight fishing, but they've got the half-day boat, the boat that used to be the Matt Walsh. It's now the California. That's running out of Ventura Sport Fishing. And also, three-quarter day, the Island Spirit. Great stuff up there at Ventura Sport Fishing. They're ready to go March 1st. You can give them a call at 805-676-3474 or VenturaSportFishing.com. All right, I think that's enough, right, Steve? We've done uh, enough on the promos. Time to get into it with Mark. And Mark, the Amigo, we fish. We have charters with you again this year. The customer service is fantastic. The fishing is always great. But the thing that's most impressive is that you guys give me the impression that there's no place too far. There's nowhere you won't go to provide good fishing. And that certainly has been the case. Yeah, yeah, wherever the fish are biting, we try to make it there if possible. So we do two-day trips with you. Mm -hmm. um, two-day trips give you a little bit more range, don't they? Yeah, if, yeah. If you're talking to the guy out there who's thinking, you know, I'd like to maybe charter with those guys, would you recommend a day trip, day and a half, two-day? Um, earlier on the season, like June, overnights are great because uh, you make it to Clemente and usually there's yellowtail or bass or a mix of different things biting at the island, good springtime island fishing. But a, uh, later on the season, past like I would say August, you want to either do a day and a half or a two day. I am totally excited about a trip we have with you guys. I believe it departs June 15th. So that's when the sea bass limit goes mm -hmm. from one to three. And it's a two day trip. So we can go up to the Channel Islands or we can stay here. I'm really excited about that. I think we may have sea bass in our future. Does does looking at the picture right now with the squid, the squid, I mean, it's pretty crazy this year, as good as we've seen it. Does that suggest anything to you in terms of a possible sea bass bite in the future? Yeah, I mean, they usually, uh, where you find a good volume of squid, that's usually where you'll catch them. And I commercial fished uh, December and uh, a little bit of January this year before I got into boat work, and this was the most squid we've seen in a while. And here. that's continuing, right? Yeah, uh, they're still seeing a good volume of squid pretty much every island Catalina, Santa Barbara, Clemente. Uh, there was a bunch of squid at San Nicolas uh, about a month ago. So there's a big volume of squid around, which is good for fishing and of course sure. the, there's that old axiom in sport fishing find the bait and you'll find the fish and normally that works out right uh yeah sometimes 
Well, I know. I mean, <laughs> I can point to our trip at Santa Barbara Island. You remember that? Yeah. We yeah. were at Nick, and we were just getting shellacked. It was so windy and rough. We might not to catch some fish, but um, then we went to Santa Barbara, and your idea was, let's go in there, turn the lights on, and if we get some squid, we got a shot. And the frickin' whole bottom of the ocean came up, made plenty of squid, passed them off to the Freedom, as I remember, and no bite the next day. So you, you yeah. can't count on it 100%, but... Man, it, it it works out in most cases. Most of the time, it's a good bet. Yeah. Yeah. So as you look ahead to, you're, you're thinking April, what do you guys, when you start running trips in April, what do you anticipate catching? Um, probably go to Clemente, try to catch some yelltail. April is usually a very windy month, but um, go to one of the island. Probably we'll be doing island fishing. And of some sort. Normally, you're catching yellowtail calico bass. Yeah, yellowtail calico bass. Uh, sometimes we'll fish rockfish. It, it just depends. Whatever's biting. And rockfish. That's. I mean, the rock fishing can be really, really good on big quality stuff, and you go home with some of the best eating fish in the sea. Yeah, yeah, they're very good eating. So, excellent. Let's talk a little bit about the amigo and what you guys have done to it. So. Mm -hmm. What are you doing down there? What's taking so long? You must be making some dramatic improvements. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, we're we repowering the boat. Um, in order to get the engines out, we had to uh, tear out the whole galley, cut off the roof, pull the engines out. Wow. Um, and then after that, it's a lot of – we put the engines in, but they still got to be aligned and stuff like that. Um, who does that? Now, do you guys do that? We have or? a couple mechanics that Dean is handle one of them? that. Dean's one of them. He's the electrician. He wires everything up. Yeah. And then uh, a couple other guys. They they're really good mechanics. They align align the engines and um, build the mounts for them and all that stuff. I'm, I'm guessing this has got to be an expensive venture. Um. Yes, it's not cheap. Right. But uh, the um, we did get funded through the state, so. That took a big chunk of it for us, but uh, yeah, it's a lot of stuff to do. It's good to it's, get funded. I got funded on the Super Bowl by Scott Buecher. <laughs> I heard. Yeah, he yeah. made a bet on the uh, Cincinnati team, and he funded me for that day. So thank you, Scott, in case you're out there listening. Anybody has a question for Mark, you're perfectly able to ask him right now. So what does that mean for me as an angler, new engines? I mean, will it be quieter? Will it be faster? Or what will it do? Well, um, so this, the state of California wants us to have Tier 4 engines, right. which don't exist for our vessels. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've heard a lot of people well, talk we, about it. Well, we, I think it's not a bad idea to talk about it right now. It's called the CARB issue. Yes. The California Air and Resource... Resource. Board, right? And they are demanding or... No, they're, I wouldn't say demanding. Um, as of right now, it sounds like they're willing to negotiate, which is good for everybody. Great. But, um, yeah, they want us to have Tier 4 engines. Eventually, they'll have Tier 4 engines, but as of right now, there is no Tier 4 engine that exists for our boat. They make them for big container ships and things like that. So what we're putting in the boat is Tier 3, which is the cleanest burning engine on the market right now yeah <clears throat> and two new generators also tier three so we'll have it's just cleaner burning more fuel efficient we'll probably go a little faster um but yeah it just had to get done so right it's better for the environment i guess we could say right yeah and, and while it's not a tier four engine it's the best that exists right now correct exactly yeah and if they did let's say they did say you got to have tier four engines in 23 you'd essentially be out of business i'm guessing right um S since the engine doesn't exist and if they say you have to have it then what i couldn't see that happening but there, there's a lot of variable variables but uh i think they're willing to negotiate to negotiate and meet us in the middle all right well that's good to hear finally that's that's something that's good to hear uh steve uh, oh steve we forgot to do the patreon thing but we'll do that in a second you have some questions over there we have one question coming in from scott mcdonald or sorry chuck mcdonald what setups are good for the early season um and then line size hooks should we pack a tuna combo or two for early season most of the time in the early season we're uh fishing the islands there's typically all that tuna's down south so we mostly focus on uh 
fish in Clemente, Santa Barbara. Uh, usually we have squid for bait, so you want to definitely have a pack of uh, 4050 50 hooks, um, some sinkers for dropper loops, some sliders as well, one ounce, uh, half ounce, um, various sizes, and uh, also have some hooks for fishing a sardine. Did you mention fluorocarbon? Is that important? Yes, uh, I, I recommend 30 pound fluoro. Okay. 30 to 40 pounds. If, if I don't have enough tackle, do you guys have it on the boat or not? You don't, do you? I mean, um, I... It just depends. I, I keep stuff on the boat yeah. just if someone needs it, but uh, I always recommend going. To, the office here has everything you yeah, possibly need. Right. right, and if I see you walking by before I go on the trip and say, Mark, what do I need to buy in here? You'll tune me up, right? Yes, exactly. And as the charter master on our trips, at least, you tune me up and I mm -hmm. tune everybody else up. So that's yeah. always very, very useful for sure. And uh, anything else there, Steve? Yep. Steve, why don't you tell everybody what we have for Patreon tonight? Because I forgot to do that up front. So Patreon members, we're going to have a drawing tonight. And Steve is going to tell you what is in the drawing. There's still time for you to sign up. That's right. So tonight we're going to be doing a jig bag uh, as well as some Iser line, fishing line that was donated by Wendy on the last episode. We also got a couple of jigs from Pro Maranahi. So it's going to be about a $50 giveaway tonight that you can win with just by entering the $5 a month Patreon. Excellent. There's so many people up there. Terry, um, Scott Grant, Chuck, you already mentioned. Marcus and Doug has a question. I just want to say hello and thanks to everybody. What's his question, Steve? So he's asking, what's your go-to setup for white sea bass? I heard that they were biting now. I would say the top three setups for sea bass would be uh, a dropper loop, like a reverse dropper loop, six ounce weight, a long leader with a big hook for a squid. Slider Sleeper on the bottom, right? Yes. Yeah. Slider and squid works great. And um, <clears throat> you can fish a jig and a squid. That's kind of old school, but it gets bit. Yo-yo jig. Nothing wrong hook. with old school, right? Especially for us old guys. Steve, something else? So um, Doug just mentioned he heard that the sea bass are biting. Have you heard anything like that? I've heard, I actually have. So, but I I don't want to. I've seen. Yeah, I've I've heard. I've yeah. been so busy with boat work, I haven't right. really gotten much details. But yeah, so some, they are some guys are, some guys are catching a few. Right. Yeah. I saw one guy. Uh, what's his name? I can't remember his name. Who's the hot, the hot guy? Hayward. Yeah, Brandon Hayward had a limits. I think. I oh, yeah, I saw some. Yeah, that looked really day. good. Yeah. Is this really early for that to be happening, or normal, or what? Um. No, it's, I've, it's not unheard of. Does I, it portend a good season, do you think? It's got to be a good signal, especially if that fish is getting taken here locally or at Catalina. It's, that, that's got to be a great signal. Yeah, it's, it's a good sign. Well, because not what a bad kind of sign. sea bass fishing did we have the last few years around um, here? Not the greatest, right? Everybody was going no. up to the Channel Islands. Yeah, that's where the bulk of the fish were. Um, last year we had a few good days of sea bass fishing. And then would you say that you it's it's an absolute must that you have to use squid for bait right now? I mean, could somebody catch a sea bass with sardines, or what, what would you say to that? Um, honestly, for sea bass, most of the time they're eating squid, but it, I have seen caught them on sardines as well. Yeah, but so, with all this squid around, they're kind of on that bait right now, yeah, right? Yeah, so. they, they seem to... Sea bass and squid kind of go hand in hand. They do, and, and we are certainly seeing that. How, how's the squid situation been at Catalina Island? Has there um, been much there? There was a giant volume in December. There was. And uh, when I was commercial fishing, fishing it. Uh -huh. Now it's kind of uh, spotty bait spots, but for the sport fishing, you can make bait. And, and, and uh, is it more than you saw last year in the previous oh, yeah, years? Oh, yeah. A lot more. Dude, I'm telling you, this June 15th trip, we're, we're going to kill them on that trip, aren't we? Yeah, I hope so. I think we have like four spots left on that trip. So um, that's going to be, I mean, I'm all over that, man. That limit going to three, I think it's just going to be a fantastic trip. And people always ask me, they start asking me now, what kind of tackle do I need for that trip? We need to wait until yeah. we get like about a week out, right? Yeah, yeah. People ask me all the time, what should I bring like a month in advance? I just tell them. Call me a few days before the trip. Calm down, everybody. We'll, we'll finally figure yeah. it out. But, yeah, I mean, people are asking me, what do I bring in September? And I'm like, I have no idea yeah. what's going to be biting then. Who knows, right? Who knows? 
Yeah, exactly. Tom is asking, so Tom Nelson is asking, what do you recommend for a rod and a reel for a sea bass uh, setup? A good reel would be like a Fathom 25 narrow and kind of like a medium, medium stick, light medium. But uh, for like a dropper loop, I would fish a little bigger reel and heavier rod with 40 pound. Jeff Yeomans is there saying he loves fishing on board the Amigo. Jeff, good to have you with us. Steve, something else? I was just going to ask, based off of, you know, if, if somebody's going to go out on the Amigo mm -hmm. early season and the, the idea is to target sea bass, how many different setups uh, should they bring? What, what should someone expect based on it being early season and that there is a potential nice sea bass bite going on? Should they be prepared for anything else when they go out? I missed half of that. <laughs> yeah, he was handing a phone. You repeat that, Steve. So, so if, with everything that's going on right now, uh -huh. with the, the squid and the sea bass, um, if someone was going out on the Amigo, say this upcoming uh, Phil Friedman trip, okay, um, there's a good potential of catching sea bass. But should they bring other setups? Like, should they be prepared for anything else on that trip? Oh yes, of course. Um, <clears throat> bring a fly line rod, uh, setup for fishing a fly line. Uh, a heavier stick for dropper loop yo-yo jig and a few lighter rods and you'll be good to go all right so if it's not perfectly obvious we're going to go back to the boat too but if it's not perfectly obvious to everyone out there listening you are the son of mark paisano obviously mark paisano jr right yep what did you think or was there ever a time in your life where you thought you might do something else or have you been groomed and 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 to be a captain and you've embraced it it's what you love to do. Is was there ever a time when you thought oh, maybe I'll be a I don't know an astronaut or something? <laughs> uh, no, I started going on the independence with my dad when I was probably 10, 10 years old, and uh, it's what I always wanted to do. Yeah, and so now you, how old are you? Uh, Twenty three. And you got your captain's license. I've been on the boat with you. You 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 have a calming effect. You are really great in terms of your work ethic, um, uh, your your expertise as a captain. I don't see anything wrong. You're you're on it. You're working hard, man. It's a lot of work, but there's some great payoffs when you catch fish, and even when you don't. Like our trip, when we went to Nick and Santa Barbara, we didn't catch a lot of fish, but I still had a really great time. Everybody, because you could see how hard you were working. You really put your heart and soul in it. Thanks. Yeah, I try my best. That's all you can do. Sometimes it works out. Other times fishing is tough. But uh, I enjoy it. And nothing else I'd want to do. So your dad was sitting right where you're sitting when I asked him the question, have you ever rescued anybody at sea? And that, of course, he gave the mm -hmm. story about Desiree. And then Desiree came in. What was that like? within your family how did that affect your father was that like no big deal or earth shattering or I oh, how did it affect you i, I mean, wouldn't say earth shattering um it was emotional for him i think uh he had always or not always but he's talked about like oh i wonder where she is or whatever like what she's doing nowadays and um it was definitely an emotional experience for him and paul yeah we, we just celebrated the one year anniversary of that podcast and Steve knows as well as I do on YouTube there every day there's new people coming and saying this is the most dramatic podcast I've ever watched in my life and and this is this has had a profound effect on me and blah 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 and it just keeps going like it's never gonna end and man I tell you I feel so fortunate to have asked your father that question and gotten that answer. Mm -hmm. And then Pablo Pena up there in the Channel Islands calls me and says, I know her. <laughs> and it just all came together. It was just really a great way to kick this podcast off. There's no doubt about that. All right, let's go back to the boat. So we've got new engines in there. What else are we doing? Uh, the whole galley is going to be uh, new. So we had to rip out the galley. Um, we're going to rebuild the benches and uh, we're adding an oven, uh, two burners for like, do whatever with those and uh grill so we'll have more cooking equipment uh just to make better food we were kind of limited with just a grill on what we could make but uh uh i wouldn't say more seating it'll probably be more comfortable seating um what, we'll, what does the boat seat i can't remember 
Um, I'm not sure what it's going to seat. Yeah. But before it was like eight, eight or nine people. Yeah, at least <clears throat> two right? seat. Yeah, yeah, we get two seatings for dinner. Yeah. So yeah. and in most groups, I know our groups this year are down to fourteen. Last time I'd throw a few extras on there, you know, so I could film mm-hmm. with my kids. But we're fourteen, and then me to do the filming. Um, that's really comfortable on that boat, right? Yeah, it's it a is. Nice light load. Yeah, fourteen is pretty comfortable. And and that makes all the difference in the world in terms of like you know you know your ratio of deckhands to people and the kind of service mm-hmm. you're going to get. It makes a big difference when it's a light load. Yeah, yeah. Because we've all, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I've been on boats when I was a deckhand with 90 people on the searcher, mm-hmm. and it's like, what the hell? I mean, you know, there's yeah, you albacore up in the bow, and mm-hmm. you're trying to chum, and you're trying to get a tangle out. It's just insane. Yeah. And somebody's going to dump a fish because the deckhand can't get to them. Mm-hmm. But that does not happen when you've got a nice light load like you do on the Amigo. Yeah, yeah, it's it's nice. I like I like it as a captain. Um, meet a lot of cool people, and you get to know everybody rather than running a boat where you carry 60, 70 people, and then it's just... Insane. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, what about um, some captains will lock the uh, wheelhouse door and uh, stay up there and lock themselves in? Are you... Up there, or are you down on deck when the guys are in a bite? I know oh, the I'm, answer, but... I'm down on deck, either on the bait tank, gaffing fish, stapling, doing whatever. You remember Jonathan Morales? You probably don't remember that name, but he was the young kid that caught a really big tuna on the trip yeah. we were on. Yeah, that, that, to that me, was cool. Yeah, right? Because I kept, I, I was like, hey, Mark, if you get a chance? Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I watched you guys. You were always on him, and finally... Uh, Twelve-year-old kid or whatever he was, never been tuna fishing before. Got like what? A, I don't know, fifty, sixty pound or something like that. I can't remember actually. It was a nice one. I can't yeah, it was good, exactly man. I mean, was. he was thrilled to death. And I see from him all the time. I get messages from him, and in fact, his father, mm-hmm. um, I think Horacio, who dropped his rod in yeah. the water, uh, Jonathan, and another guy will be on that June Amigo trip. Oh, cool! So they're coming out for sure, Steve. Yeah, we got a couple questions coming in from uh, Sal Buchert. Uh, what about the Albacore update, he's asking. Oh, the Albacore update. Well, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, just make sure you uh, <laughs> send that money over for the loss in the Super Bowl, Sal. Uh-huh. And then what is your biggest fish that you've caught, Marky? Um, I like 120-pound tuna, nothing giant. Is that recent or in these last couple of years on the bluefin bite? Yeah, that- yeah. I pulled on a lot of big ones, but myself actually dropping down and catching one, it's uh, probably like a 120-pounder. Yeah, because you're busy all the time, I'm, right? You're I, literally fishing. Right? When, I'm, when I'm riding the boat, I never fish. That's right. just my thing. And then he's also asking, what is your favorite fish to catch um, and why? I like fishing for... Uh, <laughs> Like grouper in La Paz, like actual real grouper. Yeah. That's always cool because you drop like a bonita or whatever down hole and uh, most, most of the time they break you off in the rocks. You're right. fishing heavy gear. That's always fun. La Paz is your favorite place to do that? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to Costa Rica so uh, in April. So we Have you been there before? Uh, once, but not really. I only fish for like a couple half day or whatever yeah well that's a great place to to uh, do that uh, i don't know about the grouper fishing good in costa rica um i know the dog tooth dog tooth and, and yeah, pargo and stuff yeah, like that full speed awesome good inshore fishing. fishing really really good uh rooster fishing's good where are you guys going in costa rica do you know uh i don't know exactly so we're going yeah, on the apollo there's oh you are yeah you're gonna do that who's yeah. going with you uh, me, my dad. Oh, cool. Jeff, Jeff Markland, a, bu- a bunch of sp- uh, sport boat guys. Oh, gr- do you guys have a charter or what? Um, yeah, someone we know has a charter. And how many days are you going to be on the boat? Uh, five, I think. Oh, man, that should be a blast. Yeah. You guys got to shoot some photos on that trip. Yeah, we'll take pictures. Yeah. It'll be and fun. what time of year are you going to be down there? Um, it's actually the end of March, beginning okay. of April. Yeah. So you guys are still in. Uh, yeah, the dry season pretty much down there. That should be really, really, mm-hmm. really great fishing. What else is going on on the boat? Any other? You got new engines. You got a new galley. Um, 
not much. That's it's it's a lot, but um, that's it really. New new engine room, new galley, and uh, you guys got new electronics not too long ago, right? Yeah, we have a new yeah. sonar, new plotter, all that stuff. Yeah, so you guys are all rigged up. I mean, yeah, um, Jeff was showing me the sonar mm-hmm. when he first got it. He was like a kid in a candy store with that thing. Pretty much the whole interior of the boat's new. From oh, really? the bunk room all the way to the... Oh, now cool. It's gonna so be you guys now. did the bunk room new, too, and everything? First year we had the boat, brand new bunk room. Uh-huh. Gutted it, redid it, extended the wheelhouse back. Um, so, yeah, pretty much the whole inside's new. Speaking on bunks, uh, Chuck McDonald is asking, where are the best bunks for a comfortable ride on the Amigo? So there's... Don't tell them. Don't tell <laughs> Chuck, none of your business. That's my bunk. They're all pretty comfortable. Um, the If I had to pick one, I would say probably the... Uh, it's hard to explain. You walk in, the aft bunk, it's a big wide bunk. That's the one I like. Oh, perfect. So you, you walk around Stay the out of that, Chuck. <laughs> And then Jeff uh, from the 540 Slingers mm-hmm. is asking, what is your prediction on how active the yellows will be in mid-May this year? Um, I know there's guys seeing sign of yellowtail Clemeni already, so hopefully by mid-May things are rocking and rolling and we're getting some good fish counts. They're seeing a sign now? Yeah, it's not really That's biting, great. but they're seeing schools of fish, and occasionally you'll catch a few. I'm seeing all kinds of good signals, Mark. I'm seeing the sea bass, these yellows. I am fired up about this year. I really think with all this squid around, it is going to be a banner year. Now, I may be wrong, and I'm the idiot that predicts Albacore. <laughs> and uh, so who knows? And then I predicted that uh, the Rams would win by 10 points. So I'm, my predictions are not that great, but this one I may have. Steve. Doug has a quick report here. He says he was out on the Nine Mile Bank yesterday, and he saw lots of whales. And then he wants to know if you're going to have a booth at the PCS show. I am not going to be there, Doug. I'm afraid I'm committed to something else for that weekend. But I wish you the best of luck. And I told Bill DePriest I would give him a plug. February 18th, 19th, and 20th, the Pacific Coast Sport Fishing Tackle Boat and Travel Show out there at the OC Fairgrounds. It should be a great show. Have fun, Doug. Hey, Marky, do you know if the if 22nd Street Landing or anybody will be there to represent Amigo at PCS show this year? So the landing will have a booth. Um, Saturday, I'm going to try to be there for a little bit. Uh, it just depends what I have going on down here. I've been pretty busy. But Sunday, I, I should be there. I'm going to make it a point to show up Sunday. Mark, uh, if you had to, I mean, we're just talking generally now. Catching yellowtail. Let's talk bait. Um, fish and squid, what's the the best setup? Pound test, um, else. I would say it's whatever, like uh, well, you're fishing time squid. of year. Let's say you're fishing time squid. Time of year, early spring when we're making squid. Yeah. Um, dropper loop, yo-yo jig works great, and uh, slider and a squid. Yo-yo jig works good wherever you are, Clemente, Santa Barbara. Most of the time when there's, like you're fishing a squid nest or something, you drop a yo-yo jig, jig down. <clears throat> It, it gets bit. Okay, and then you can fish as heavy as you like with that, right? With that, yeah, 40, 60. 50, 60 if you'd want. Yeah, some guys fish 100. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like me, I like doing that. Uh, color important on the jig? Um, I always like scrambled egg or uh, like a darker green color. All right, because we have a lot of guys who have been coming in here recently, including uh, you know the guy from Taddy and everybody else, and saying, I don't think color is really important. It. Yeah, it, it's... They, they say it's the way the jig swims. But yeah, as long... What do you think? As long as you get it in front of it, it uh, they'll bite it. I wouldn't fish like a bright pink jig or anything. Uh, like fluorescent I'll pink. I'll try that. Steve Nothing has some crazy. underwear like that, actually. <laughs> you want to model those, Steve? No. No, Steve won't do that. All right. Um, and for people that don't even know what, the, what that means, mm-hmm. go into some detail about... How to yo-yo, and most importantly, how do you hook the fish? Some people think you rear back and set the hook, which is not what you do. So yo-yoing the iron, what do you do? So you you can cast it out a little bit if you'd want. It really doesn't matter. You could drop it straight down. And once you hit the bottom, you want you start winding medium speed, fast, medium, fast speed. And uh, 
just keep winding. Even if a fish bites it, you keep winding. That's how you hook them on the yo-yo jig. Do you, and say you don't get a bite, do you come all the way back up to the surface or do you go about halfway, kick it in free spool and drop it ha- down again? Halfway. Wind it halfway up, three quarters of the way up and drop it back down. Right. And some, you know, I know when Patrick had not fished a lot of yo-yo iron for some reason, I don't even know why, but when we were on the Amigo, we were fishing Cortez Mac, he thought he, like, he was snagged on the bottom until it started, you know, pulling line on the 100 pound. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's just like wham, right? I mean, it yeah. just loads up. Yeah, they just jump on it, kind of. It just comes out of nowhere and just can't. Usually your hand falls off the handle. But. Yeah, I have a question. Exactly, so, yeah. When, specifically when yo yo fishing, is there ever an instance where you shouldn't do it? Like, if you know that people are catching yellowtail and. Is there, uh, you know, is it ever too shallow for yo-yo fishing? Is it ever too deep? Does, Good question. It, does it, you know, does it matter if you're over, you know, uh, over a sandy bottom, rocky bottom? Can you explain on that a little bit? I always like to um, fish it sandy bottom, like on a squid nest or something. If you drop one down in the rocks, you're going to lose it. Or in the kelp, kelp is not a place for a yo-yo jig. You'll snag your jig and lose it. Um, yeah. yeah. And then. Uh, uh, Chuck is asking, how do you fish the dropper loop? Do you fish it in gear, out of gear, slow retrieve? What do you recommend? Um, once you hit the bottom, put it in gear and take a few winds and kind of just make sure you're fe- you feel your bait. You could drop it back down, kind of just work it a little bit. Take five, six winds, slowly drop it down. That's how I like to fish it. And then Jeff is asking, do you suggest fishing J hooks or circle hooks for yellowtail? I like J hooks for yellowtail. I've always liked them. 1020 J hooks. All right, let's say it's Sal Buchard. What, what has he got Sal Buchard up there for? I know that's Scott. Sal Buchard wants to know um, you're, you're fishing a heavy jig when you're fishing the yo yo iron, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I and like he- a shorter rod kind of a bigger size reel with 40 50 pound test okay perfect how about if we switch over to the surface iron for yellowtail Mm -hmm. what kind of iron what kind of you i mean jeff he's gonna have his 10 foot rod you know that and there's nothing better than that but for the average guy 10 might be a little too much right Uh, what do you suggest both in terms of gear and selection of iron technique if you could cover that on fishing surface iron for yellowtail I like a nine foot rod personally. I'm not that big of a guy, so ten foot rod's a little much for me. Yeah. But a uh, nine foot rod, uh, like a uh, Trinidad twenty forty pound test. That's my go to setup. I like seven X's, forty fives. Um, just yeah. Color again. Um, my favorite color surface iron blue and white works good. Um, mint, mint's one of my favorites. All right, and um, forty pound, good. What yeah, I like forty pound, not too heavy, right. yeah, not right. too light. Yeah, and retrieve fast, um, slow, just depends. Medium. You kind of just gotta. What does it depend on? Or you explain that. You just, I, I like trying different speeds. See okay, what's that, that's best. important, right? Yeah, you just, it's just trial and error, see what works. Yeah. Sometimes they're eating the Some, fast yeah. retrieve, and sometimes, sometimes they're not. Yeah, exactly. Steve. Yeah, I had a quick question. Is there anything that you would recommend to, to people that go out on these trips and they're targeting yellowtail? And sometimes, you know, they buy, you know, a lot of guys will just fly line. A lot of guys will do the yo-yo thing. A lot of guys will do the surface iron thing. And there's a few guys that they only feel comfortable doing fly line because they've never mm-hmm. practiced doing yo-yo or they've never practiced the surface iron thing. Um, what can th- those people do so that they have, they know how to do all those techniques when they're out on the boat with you, just to you know improve uh, their chances of actually catching the yellow tone if they're only getting you know if they're only being hooked on the surface iron mm-hmm. or if they're only being hooked on yo yo iron. What do you recommend that they do before they go out on the trip with you so that they can, you know, know how to do or practice how to do that without being on the boat? Like practice casting a jig. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, home. Tie like a tennis ball on the end of your jig rod and just start casting. And then, Practice do you think perfect. that would make a big difference? Like, you know, if if you notice that the only guys that are hooking the the yellow tail are on the surface iron, w- would that make a big difference for somebody to actually sit at home and you know use some free time and practicing uh, making those casts with with the tennis ball, like you mentioned? I would say uh, most of the time, if they're 
eaten uh, a surface iron, they'll eat a sardine, fly line sardine. But uh, if you have to fish a surface iron, I would say it's very important you know how to cast a decent distance. Otherwise, you're not going to get bit most of the time. Yeah, and it's also really important, right, Mark, to like pay attention. Like, um, like you see a boil, you want to mm-hmm. cast that boil. You see birds working, you want to see a bird yeah. dip down. You want to be on that, right? Yeah. So you've got to kind of have that paying attention. Got to be aware. Right? That's just fishing in general. You got to be aware, looking around. It's so important. Otherwise, it really is. Uh, JS is asking, what is some current intel that you can give on bluefin? Have you heard anything on? Bluefin being out there right now, are they seeing anything? What what kind of intel have you heard currently? Most of the boats, um, at least that I talked to, are doing maintenance right now. So nobody's really fishing for bluefin, honestly. But there were some guys that fished like maybe a month or so ago, and they were still getting them, weren't they? And some San Diego boys were getting them. Yeah, down below the border. Oh, they were going down below the, the border. Yeah, okay. mo- late in the season, um, I've heard rumors that there's still some fish at Tanner. Yeah, me too. Which is kind of weird, but that I mean, water's they were gonna be cold out there now. We it? were catching them full speed in December, which yeah, is which is weird. If you would ask me that a few months before, I'd be like, "No, we're not going to fish bluefin in December." But they were out there and they were biting. It's almost like it's a year-round fishery now. It's so incredible to see that. And the Mexican Saner fleet, they've already reached their quota for the year, so that pressure will not be on that fishery again here. For the rest of the year, and that makes a huge difference, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Once you start wrapping nets around them, it's definitely a game changer. I mean, I remember in the old days, you, you, you'd go out there, and, man, there'd be saners everywhere, and they'd just wipe it, you know, wipe mm-hmm. it up. It'd be done. Yeah. And you're just, like, shaking your head. But now, you know, the guys have reached their quotas, and it's, it's, uh, it's really incredible. You know, even in the Santa Monica Bay, Mark, um, there used to be bluefin that would come in there. And we'd see them on the local boats when I was working on those local boats. And uh, on a foggy night, some saner would come in there, and then you'd start seeing fish with net burns. And you're just like, oh, well, that got screwed up. No wonder we're not catching any more BFT here. So yeah. thank God that, that pressure's off. Steve? A lot of guys that we've talked to, a lot of guys that fish, we know like to also hunt. So Hunter Calvert is asking, do you like to hunt, Mark? And, and if so, what do you like to hunt for? I do. I do. Um... Once a year, I I go to um, Idaho, I hunt duck and pheasant. Um, that's usually what I do, hunt duck and pheasant. But uh, I'd like to shoot a deer. That'd be cool. You've never shot anything like that? Like no, a- I might plan a trip to go to Montana or something, shoot one. Steve, you hunt, right? Yeah. You, what do you like to hunt for? Uh, you I, shoot these pigs all the time, don't you? Yeah, I like to do boar hunting, and then uh, I do a little bit of coyote. But I, I also, my next hunting trip is hopefully going to be a deer hunt. Um, probably Colorado. Um, but, yeah. And those pigs that you're shooting, are you, like, where are you doing that? Are you going to some place where you pay the guy and there's a pig at a water trough and you exactly, shoot Exactly, yeah. It is? Yeah, really? They, they tie them up for you, so it's a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, it, it's up north in Northern California. You can do it every... Uh, yeah. There's all kinds of places in California where you can do it. Um, I like to go up north, a little bit further up north, because it's a little bit more natural. It feels like a real hunt. Yeah. Um, you have to hike all day and then find them. And it's more like... It, it feels like fishing yeah you know you're you're on the hunt yeah exactly you're it's like bluefin fishing you're out there you're looking for them and when you find them that's the opportunity and if you don't find them well hey that's that's that it is what it is yeah and i'm sure you've eaten those things how are those things they gotta be delicious it's yeah it's better than than store-bought ham better than you know it's really lean is it or not it can be it depends so the bigger ones you get they're pretty fatty yeah um the smaller you kind of want to get one that's around between 80 and 150 that's probably the best ones that in my opinion um, the meat is lean and it's nice and tender as they get bigger it can get a little bit tougher it's not too bad people some people say it's they they prefer not to get the, that big i don't really care i mean there is a little bit of a difference to the meat but it's still good yeah yeah and do you eat the the ducks you're shooting up there or not yeah yeah how are they it's good. I, um, Are, do you like to cook? I mean, do you have a recipe or anything? Or you know, I know it's good smoked. Or I'll make like I'll cut them in little cubes and make kind of like a kebab out of them. Throw them on the grill. Oh, that must be must be good. Huh? Yeah, I love th- duck. I'm crazy about duck. A lot of a lot of people don't like it, but uh, I like it. It's good. Is it like the duck you get in like pecking duck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's I don't, probably I've never leaner. had duck, but 
You've oh never my, had duck? No. Really? My buddies, they like to go to the Salton Sea and do it. There's a bunch of places down here to do it. Um, I've never done it, but it, it's fun from what I hear. Yeah, Rick Effinger the, from Marina Del Rey Sport Fishing, he used to give me duck. He'd go to San Quentin and do what he called cast and blast. You know, he'd go fishing. And mm-hmm. and I was throwing him in the crock pot, I think, with some wine and oregano and garlic and a little olive oil. They were freaking good. But like when I was living in China, there was a the one place I taught at uh, once a week, and there was a guy like right across the street, and I'd run over there, and like I think it was three bucks, you get a whole duck, and the guy chopped it up, and he'd spice it up, and oh my god, I love duck like that, it's so good. I'm gonna have to try some of that when you get back next time. Bring me one. Oh, I went. I have some actually. You do? Yeah, cool. I didn't bring back a whole lot, but a few breasts. Steve. So transitioning back into fishing, Pumpkin Jones is asking, what are your rod and reel recommendations for bluefin tuna fishing on the Amigo? Um, so I would have uh, probably a medium, medium, uh, like a light medium rod for fly lining with a, call it a 25, 30 size reel, 30 pound test, uh, and then... That's for smaller grade fish or fish when they're yeah small finicky? smaller grade fish and uh, most of the time it's kind of hard to get a bite yeah so lighter setup right and then when you're fishing the big stuff that's a whole another thing you're gonna want to have like a thirty thirty wide or a big reel heavy rod two hundred pound test lots of spectra on your reel for flat falling. Um, and when you're fishing those fish, do you want to fish heavy line like 130 pound? Having a heavy setup is key for big fish. Right. Do you like flat falls or knife jigs or irrelevant to you? Do you um, like them both? Or? I've seen them both work great. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of getting in front of the fish that wants to eat it. Those knife jigs, like one thing I hear from some guys is that when you say, the captain says, mm-hmm. you know, I got fish, mm-hmm. drop. They get down there quicker. Yeah, they do. Yeah. I've noticed that, and I I would favor knife jigs more than a flat fall. Yeah, I would say, uh-huh. but they both work great. I wouldn't discourage anybody from fishing a flat fall. Yeah, right on, Steve. JS is also asking, uh, do you happen to give tours of the pilot house when you're out on the trips? He said he knows that most captains don't like to do that, but he really likes it when captains do do that. Yeah, I won't tell anybody like get out of the wheelhouse or anything um, you told me that <laughs> just um, me though right yeah like like if i'm trying to get on a school i'm trying to pay attention right, someone's up right. there like asking me a million questions i might say hey give me a break for a give second me a second there. and i'll show you everything once i get the boat yeah stopped or anchored up but yeah everybody's welcome ask whatever questions they want and check it out yeah because a lot of people like they they've never seen the sonar before mm-hmm. or they're not exactly sure or they've got a private boat and they just bought a sonar and they're like hey cap can you give me a few tips here and you guys on the amigo are great about that i would say um the best time to go up to the wheelhouse is probably on the way home and then you could see whatever you'd like perfect yeah. perfect joe patino is a marine Thank you for your service, Joe. Happy birthday to your son. I know you're celebrating his birthday. He's one of the best people on the face of the earth. Joe, I don't even know if Joe knows this, he gave me a knife that he told me I could cut myself out of a car in. And I took that knife to China. I don't even know Joe. <laughs> and that's the knife that the first day I was going to walk out and go out, I showed the Chinese teacher, Shelly, I go, hey. Um, she goes, what are you doing? And I go, well, was it safe out there? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, you're going to get thrown in jail. So I brought that knife with me, Joe, and I thank you so very, very much. There's a, over in Seal Beach, there's like the military area, you know, where the, mm-hmm. and if you know a military guy, you can go in there and surf fish. And we went in there with Joe and whaled on the fish in there. Oh, I bet. there's the nobody in good. there. Yeah. And yeah. it was freaking great, man. Halibut and yellowfin croaker and everything else. Joe uh, is uh, somewhere on the East Coast now, I think, and really nice to see you, my friend. I really, really appreciate you dropping in on us. So, Mark, uh, we've covered the yo-yo iron for Yellowtail. Mm -hmm. Now, as we start to talk more about white sea bass, because I'm hung up on that, I'm telling you, we're going to get limits of sea bass for everybody on this trip coming up. Um, 
if when you talked about the squid and jig method, can you talk about that just a little bit? That's not yo-yoing, is it? No, it's pinning some squid on it and dropping it down to the bottom, and then what do you do? I mean, you kind of just, just sit there, bounce it up and down on the bottom, kind of slower, and they'll just eat it. They'll suck it in like any other squid. Yeah, really. because what sea bass are doing. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. So when when squid spawn, they die. Yes, and so there's a blanket of squid on the bottom. And sea bass are like little vacuum cleaners or big vacuum cleaners, mm-hmm. right? They're just coming through and scooping that up, right? Yeah, they're eating half dead or dead squid off the bottom. So that brings up the question, is that important? Fresh dead, live, both work? Do you have a preference? Maybe fresh dead's better? What do you think? Um, I would say live's always the best because even if you hook a squid on, it doesn't have long to live. Right. <clears throat> But um, fresh dead uh, live were good. I wouldn't like dead pink squid. I wouldn't use. They yeah, just like exactly. it fresh. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you're just bouncing that squid up off the bottom like that, right? Yeah, you're correct. fishing. Can you fish sixty pound when you're doing that? Um, or do you recommend like 40? 40, 40. just because sea bass are picky. Color of the jig important. A lot of people say uh, you know white jig with the red little red. I like glow in the dark white uh-huh. glow in the dark jig. You think the glow in the dark gives you an advantage? Uh, at night it does, I think. Kind of just catches their eye. And, and do you like a treble hook or a big single hook or what? A uh, single hook. You do? Yeah. If you hook a fish on a single hook, it, you've hooked them a lot better than yeah, a Yeah, you got that big hook and you got them pinned pretty good, yeah. right? Yeah. All right, so um, any other thing on sea? Well, you know, why do they call sea bass? They're so enigmatic. I mean, everybody says they're so mysterious and... and what is it about sea bass that makes them so difficult, I guess? You know? uh, it's, I don't know the answer to that question, but um, they're just, they're weird. They're different from a lot of, a lot of other fish. I mean, they bite wide open one day mm-hmm. and then they're gone. And, and they're, I mean, like sometimes yellowtail are a little more consistent, right? Yeah. And they're, other species they're are more consistent. A lot more consistent. Sea bass just are like fickle, aren't they? They're just like, they, they move around or I don't know what the deal is. Yeah, they're they're weird. I've seen them eat some backwards rig with beads and stuff on it. And then other times you came again. Well, to bite. you know, that's funny you mention that because how many times have we seen like a deckhand or the captain, maybe not saying something to somebody, but looking and going, no freaking way that guy's ever... And that that's the guy that gets a fish. Yeah. And, of course, you know, we always used to laugh that, uh, you know, you're sitting there fishing for sea bass, and it was like, you need to, like, put your rod down and mm-hmm. put it on clicker and, you know, go go get a burger or something. When you come back, I'm sure you'll have... And <laughs> it seems like that, that that's sometimes, how it is. Huh? Sometimes it works like Some that. Some guys say that your rod fish is way better for sea bass when you put it in... And just let the boat kind of rock like that. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. It's crazy. Yeah. Steve? Yeah, so JS is asking, is there, uh, it looks like the Amigo is mostly booked up. Phil, do you have any space on your charter for somebody that uh, wants to go solo? JS, we do. Um, so I'm just trying to think. Our June trip is our first one, and that's going to be June 15th. I think we have four spots left on that. Uh, it le- departs June 15th, like at 10 o'clock at night, right? We leave at 10. Yeah. And Nine or ten. It's a two day trip. Cause we always do two day trips, JS, because you know if we have weather the first day or we miss the first day and we get intel, we've got another day that we can fish. And one of the reasons I booked that trip was, and I was really amazed it was still open, is because the limit goes. First of all, I was looking at all the squid around and thinking to myself, this has got to be good for sea bass this year. You know, even out here at Catalina, even locally. And on a two-day, we can go up to the Channel Islands. I, fa- I, I had that factored in, and then also the fact that um, the limit goes from one to three. So on that trip, you could take home six white sea bass because you have two days. So fingers crossed. We have that trip, and then we have another trip in the fall. And typically, that's Cortez Bank, Bluefin Tuna, that kind of stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah. Those trips have been absolutely awesome. So, yeah, uh, you can give me a call at, what's my phone number, 657 227 Thank you, Steve. 
looking at me like I'm nuts. Go ahead, Steve. And then Jeff is asking. He likes to provide pizza for his uh, for his crew when he does his trips on the Amigo. What's a good place uh, as far as a pizza recommend local pizza recommendation? I would say Nico's on Sixth Street is a good spot that I like to go to. Mark, do you have any recommendations? Um, Nico's is good. Big Nick's is good. That's uh, the well, guy who owns. Right? Yeah, the the guy who owns Nico's and Big Nick's. I think they're brothers. Oh, okay. I think something like that but those two places are good normally i do homemade carnitas burritos so you've had those right you got yeah i had one right? <laughs> yeah uh so i and maybe i'll have to be smart like jeff and just go to a pizza place it's a much easier but normally i cook up a big meal for the departure also whenever we go so i know a lot of you guys are coming from work and all, and all of that and jeff's thinking the same thing so i i try to have some homemade some kind of Mexican dish. I like cooking Mexican food. So uh, we definitely do that. I think, uh, where can I book a trip? Tom Nelson is asking that. Um, you can talk to these guys, or if you're talking about one of our trips, Tom, once again, you can give me a call at 6, or just send me a text tonight, 657-227-6459, and then I'll send you the list of trips. And if people want to call, should they call the landing, or what, um, what should they do? So we have a charter phone number. I don't have it on me. Uh-huh. at this moment um and for open party trips i did add a couple handfuls of two days already they're already on the schedule you can call 22nd street landing uh at 310-832-8304 right there's probably six or seven two days already up on the really schedule. oh that's yeah. great because it's good to get like people that if they're not on a charter, they can mm-hmm. finally go on an open Yeah, and they can, they can see the boat, and maybe they'll want to charter the boat in the future. Now is not a good time, I realize. But, like, later on, when, if the boat is sitting here in the docks, can people come and look at the boat? or um, for, I mean, if there's somebody there, yeah, not if there's, walk on. Yeah, if I'm there, I'd, I wouldn't want anybody walk right. on the boat and get hurt. Yeah, but, right. Um, yeah, I, I'd be more than happy to show people. Or maybe the they could set something up with Mike and say, "Hey, yeah, I'd they, like to come down they could and, call ahead, and I'd meet them down there and show them." The and, and if there's a group, and Steve's got another question in a second, but if there's a group of novice anglers, mm-hmm. okay, and they're listening to this and they're going, you know, yo-yo iron and yellowtail and tuna and oh my god, white sea bass is like the biggest thing I've ever caught before is a trout at Santa Ana River Lakes mm-hmm. or something like that. Can you take that group? out and can they have a productive fun time oh yeah um myself and the crew will make sure that we get them all dialed in and explain everything to them in detail and um have them catch a few fish and then just go from there hopefully they'll come back and they'll progress as time goes on yeah excellent steve Dino Rochetti is tuning in. He wants to remind Dino. everybody that the uh, Battle of the Branches at BNS Brewery in Santee, California is this Sunday at 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So that's a great event that we want to support. Right. Joe is a great guy who's worked so hard at that. Um, that battle is going to be on five boats, I think, Dino, right down there in San Diego on March the 25th. And I will be down there, and uh, a lot of other guys, like Greg from Opson is going to be there. Um, a friend of mine, Andrew Deal, is going to come down. Joe didn't know that, but uh, he's going to come down with me. And then the next day, I actually, after that, I'm going to head down to Mexico and shoot some videos down there. But looking forward to it. Dino, thanks for pointing that out. Once again, the guys who make all of this possible for all of us are the guys, the men and women in our armed forces. Because without them, we don't have the sweet gift of freedom. And we thank them so very much for their service, for their sacrifices. And Dino, I thank you so much for pointing that out. That is really great. Um, It's always good to get, uh, do you get many service guys out or Um, military guys? It's always great to see those guys. They're some of the best people on the face of the earth. They are, they are. Just like... You know, Joe was just up there a second ago. I think about that guy all the time. I think about him getting us on the base and doing all that fishing with him. It's really, really fun. Do you like to surf fish? Do you ever do any of that? Um, I, I've i done it. Um, you, you don't sound too crazy about it. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I, I caught some surf perch and stuff. I, it's not my favorite type of fishing, but yeah. it, it's fun. I'm telling you, man, when you get in, when it's biting, like really biting, it's freaking awesome. I love some of those bites. 
I'm going to go hit some of these beaches um, in Colonet, Punta Colonet. There's some sandy beaches mm -hmm. there that I haven't fished. I usually go down to San Quentin and San Vicente, and I'm going to hit those after this March 25th trip and shoot some video. Oh, cool. When I was your age or younger, I'd drive to San Quentin, mm -hmm. and my brother and I would fill a nice chest full of bar perch and then bring them back to Chinatown in Los <laughs> Angeles and make our money and then head back down there again. And we were just on this roll where... We kept doing that, but you catch them two at a time, three at a time. It was just epic. Really, really, really fun fishing. Steve, do you have something over there? All right, so um, let's kind of, we, we've talked about the spring bite, um, the summer bite. What what starts to happen then? We'll define summer as, well, let's do it as, as, as they do chronologically, like late June into July. What, what, um, what happens? Are we still catching sea bass? Is there more yellowtail? I mean, every year is different, but um, typically we have very good fishing um, at the islands for yellowtail. Uh, sea bass is a possibility, and uh, August is kind of a transitioning month to where uh, we'll start to fish the banks for bluefin and have some. We <clears throat> last year we've had some good yellowtail fishing out there, so it just depends. Every year's different so we'll see what this year has in store for us and then when you get to the fall mm -hmm. that's when the banks traditionally really get going like yeah out there in july sometimes it's a little dicey even mm -hmm. august right late august september october november are normally great months those, out are, of the those are the best months to fish the bank yeah and for a couple reasons number one the fish bite good mm -hmm. but also your best weather months in southern california are in the fall right Correct, yeah. So this past season, we had really, really, really good bluefin fishing up until we had two or three big blows in October, which usually we have flat, calm, Santa Ana conditions. Probably I had something to do with that because I, I was picking all the windy days last year. And, uh, I think I got that. I hope I got that out of my system, Mark. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that just shut it, shut it down for a few weeks for us. And then once... The weather rebounded and the water temperature picked back up. It seemed like uh, the fish started biting again. If you're going to set up a charter, how important is moon phase? Do you, do you, would you, if you're, if you're going to chart or you were going to tell your best friend, hey man, here's when you want to be on the boat. Do you factor in the moon phase at all? Um, yeah, I, I've noticed for, tuna fishing um like coming up on the full moon coming off of the full moon but i've seen them bite there yeah just i know many. so it it really doesn't matter i would just pick a day and go for it yeah i know i know exactly what you're saying because like you go out and it's wide open fishing and a guy will look at you and go it's a full moon man that's what it is and you go like a month later and it sucks and a guy will go, yeah, it's the full moon, right? You yeah. Know, they just read it either way. Mm -hmm. But like sea bass fishing, that 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 is like, I like that period like before the full like that, like mm -hmm. a week before, a couple, well, like four days before the full. Am I crazy or do, um, you, do, do you see good fishing around that time too? Well, I know when I'm squid fishing, like full moon's no good for squid fishing. Right. They, they won't. They kind of or, disperse I mean, with the, the light? No, full moon's good. There's a lot of light. Uh -huh. So they, they'll they come up. But uh -huh. um, uh, it, it's just, it, uh, it depends. So uh, you're, you're, you're not sold on, like, trying to base anything on that, right? No. On, on the moon phase. Mm -hmm. You'd say, just pick it up. I mean, it has, it affects the current. There's just so many variables. I, I'm not a scientist. I don't want to get all technical with it. Um. Well, I have don't because you'll lose me. I have to fish with pretty much every day, so right. I'm going to try my best to uh, catch fish no matter what the moon phase is. What is the hardest thing about being a captain? Um, finding fish, paperwork. What is it? What, what's the hardest part about your job? I would say the hardest part is just the amount of stress of like when fishing's tough. The amount of stress I put on myself to find fish, it uh, that's the hardest part. You get people down on deck talking, 
talking shit. Boy, this guy doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Yeah, and you know? I why I, is he fishing here? Didn't we just do this? Yeah, at first, at first, it really bothered me, but I just learned to let it go in one ear and out the other, and just do the best I can. Well, I had a long talk with Steve and told him to knock that off. So <laughs> I know that was really getting to I, you there. I actually wanted to to ask you that because you're so young. Um, I know that a lot of guys that just working in the fishing industry, a lot of older guys may come on the boat with some ego and they mm -hmm. think they might know more than you. How often do you experience that? Um, not too often. Every now and again you'll get one or two guys, but I don't let it bother me. And then is there has there been any instances where you, that's happened and then you've prove to them by having a very successful trip and now they're like more you know loyal to you or, or yeah they, yeah you gain their respect basically yeah Have you seen that as well yeah yeah but the, the question that steve asked uh, that i think is mm -hmm. uh, that i'd like to just dig into just a little bit more do you get most of those comments from people who are novice anglers who really don't or do you get them from guys that are hot shots that think like, ah, this snot-nosed young kid, he doesn't really know. Who, who do you think you get it more from? It's usually... Because some people, novice guys, they don't they don't understand like yeah. why you're re-anchoring and it looks like you're anchoring. So I get that because mm -hmm. I, I, they don't know. But the guys that are like the know-it-alls, that would bug me even more, I would think. Most of the comments I get are when they first walk on the boat and I'm doing the speech. I would say that's when I hear most of the comments. <laughs> you mean you're doing the speech and you hear somebody whispering like or what? Yeah, or they'll say something like, oh, how old are you, 12? Or, really? Yeah, I've gotten that <laughs> before. But are they kidding or are they like? Yeah, kind of, but they're kind of serious. I yeah. Think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Go ahead. Uh, Dale is asking, I guess he's interested in hopping on the Amigo because he's asking, is there a place... Uh, Walking distance from the landing here to park his RV. Can I say hi to Dale and his lovely daughters and wife? It's always good to see you, Dale, Mr. Baja. And I think the parking lot will be here on uh, what is that harbor? Or, uh, it's so the parking lot. Um, that big one right on the corner there. Yes, I've seen RVs parked be there before. I'm not exactly sure if it's allowed. I think the the. the you can definitely get the answer by calling Mike down at the landing. I know he knows because I think he's mentioned before that they actually have access to that parking oh, lot. Oh, cool. But that would be a question for Mike down at the landing. Um, I want to say that that lot would, would work for an RV and it's right across the street. And there's plenty of parking here at 22nd Street Landing. If, you know, I know down in San Diego, when I go out of H&M, yeah. that parking lot is a nightmare. Yes. That's the nice thing about fishing out of 22nd Street Landing. There's plenty of parking there's tons of parking yeah across the street or anything else uh, so dale that's steve was talking about mike morrison call him or anybody who works tony or janelle did i say hi to tony and janelle for holding down the fort tonight no, you didn't. i forgot tony janelle they're out front and i want to thank them very very much so that's who you want to talk to they're there now dale if you want to give them a call steve next no okay so um as we start to move like into the winter time mm -hmm. is it worth fishing anymore yeah you, know, you just mentioned a second ago that we were catching bluefin tuna in december for god's sake so yeah i don't know yeah. that you can bank on that but i i wouldn't be counting on it but um you never know but what about and a lot of the guys that are listening are gonna say rock high give me a freaking break mm -hmm. guys like you and me maybe steve Rock Hot is like some of the best stuff. When you go to Nicholas, remember that cheap set I got lucky and got? Yeah. How, how many feet of water were we fishing at? Five, 40 or 50 feet. God, it, and it was full speed, yeah. and it was blowing 35. It was crap weather. Yeah. And we were still, that, that fishing is so much fun. And when you get into that 40, 50, 60 feet of water, it's like bass fishing, right? Mm -hmm. It's exactly what it is, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we caught some bass that trip, too. I right. Think. Fishing in the kelp, big sheephead, giant whitefish. It's fun, leadhead and squid fishing. Yeah, it is it is a kick, no question. Steve? Well, since you guys are talking about rockfish, uh, Rob's Fishing Channel is asking, what do you guys think about the new rockfish limits on the reds and the chucks? What other rockfish are we supposed to keep besides those? Rob, good to see you, buddy. Um, I am not very stoked about these new regs i think they're kind of ridiculous and the surveys they did are very inaccurate but um 
you're allowed one chucklehead and four reds. Uh, well, and then the rest would be what, Boccaccio? And- um, you keep whitefish, sheephead, uh, pretty much like starry eyes, um, bank perch, stuff like that. Boccaccio Blue rockfish. No? Yeah, Blue Boccaccio. Yeah. Um, so we'll catch our one chucklehead and four reds, and then we'll uh, descend whatever we can't keep and try to make the best of it. Yeah. Um, so you think that that was based on inaccurate data? So where they, what I've heard when where they were doing the survey was locally here, which of course there's not going to be a very, um, there's not going to be a lot of chucklehead locally. It's just we've never really caught much chucklehead yeah, locally right. for whatever reason. Yeah. Whether it gets fished harder or it's just they the, they don't like the bottom. Um, like out at the banks, I haven't really seen very many chucklehead. Um, San Nicolas is a very good island for chucklehead. Channel Islands, there's a lot of chuckleheads up there. They probably should have um, asked us where we catch the most chucklehead and did their surveys. And right. Kind of asked us our opinion, but it is what it is. Who did this? Are they, the Department of Fish and Wildlife? Is that who did that? or No, uh, our Department of Fish and Game. Uh-huh. Yeah. All right, well, it is what it, it is. is. I mean, they is. made a similar kind of decision. I talked about this on the show with Grunion. Um, some woman who has a Grunion YouTube channel Mm -hmm. made the comment that, wow, I didn't see much Grunion here. You know, like, is there like, oh, okay, well, let's restrict the months you can take Grunion now and the amount of Grunion. Like, wait a second, how how scientific is that? If that is indeed true. Okay, that's what the the Mm -hmm. rumor was. So if Mm -hmm. that's not true, I stand corrected. But I mean, you know, Patrick and Philip and I, we have this video of just the beaches covered with Grunion. The last few years so it's it's a lot about where you're at and where these surveys take place yeah and then they they start to make these decisions that have pretty severe business impacts on you oh, guys, for right? sure for sure like at san nicholas uh can't sometimes you there's just so much chucklehead it's all mostly what you're catching it's going to have a huge impact on us but we'll adapt and work around it yeah i'm sure that'll be fine sheep said is another fish that they were talking about yeah there was putting a limit on right talk about it but who knows what's going to happen yeah hopefully not and there's nothing wrong with sheep's head and white fish and all those oh, great filler radiating. fish that you can catch you can catch how many reds four four yeah four they and one decreased it by one okay. it was five now it's four yeah uh, speaking of that fishery out on you know when you're at nicholas though if you get out into the deeper water Wow, uh, there are some big fish there, isn't there? Yeah, and like forty fathoms, there's a uh, decent five, six pound reds. Yeah, so it's always nice. You can mix that up a little bit, right? When you're catching some surface stuff, you can yeah. go out and fish that deep stuff for a little while. Even at Nick, like I like to fish like in the morning, 120 feet shallower, and you catch big white fish and other stuff as well. So. Um, Sal Buchert is asking, let's see. Sheephead oh. in the surf. Is that what he's talking about? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, your husband, Kim. Uh, fish. He caught a sheep's head in the surf the other day. Scott wants the albacore update, and he keeps putting it out there over and over and over again. I've already done the preliminary albacore update, which is <laughs> conditions are exactly the same as they were last year predicting a La Nina, although Tommy Holland sent me a note tonight and said that somebody's predicted much warmer water now, and if that's indeed the case, then any hopes for albacore will go out the window. So right now, I mean, before I heard this from Tommy, um, it looked like we had similar conditions, which were favorable for albacore, but then you get to that fork in the road a little bit later, like April, May, and we either go to the cooler water, which would favor Albi, or the warmer water, which would obliterate any hope of that. Have you caught many albacore? Twenty three years. When I was younger. Yeah. yeah. Like how old? That was my first tuna. Uh, probably eight or nine. You were catching them on the Independence or what? Yeah, on a three day trip. Pretty I think cool. It was huh? my first long trip, and I caught a bunch of albacore. I have pictures at home, but. Um, yeah, that's my first Pictures thing. of the mysterious <laughs> albacore, which we haven't seen for so long, right? Yeah. yeah. We, we were on the Polaris Supreme uh, one time on a Father's Day trip, 
and th- we got into some good algae fishing and I remember for whatever reason my kids were really young like seven and ten or me- maybe even younger and they were like busting fish off and so I like go hey seriously we need to have a meeting right now so we have this I go they're freaking biting put the wood to them okay <laughs> and so, you know, we're just wailing on them after that. It was so much fun. And, you know, you just put them, put them on the side of the boat when they're young and they can't cast, you know, just, you know, where they drop straight down, their bait goes out yeah. and you watch an albacore come up and eat it. Yeah. Those things are so cool. Steve. Uh, Nick Musgraf is asking, what is your favorite size reel to chuck irons with? Good question, Nick. And I want to just say to everybody out there, thank you so much for all the great questions. Keep them coming. Uh, Trinidad 20, that's like my go-to surf siren reel. And why is that? Why is that reel, why is your, that your go-to? It's not too big, it's not too small. Um, like, personally, like a 30 is kind of wider, and it's a lot of reel to be casting, making casts after casts right. with, so it's just what I like. Everybody has a Yeah, personal different. preference. You ever catch any bluefin on the surface siren? Um, yeah, occasionally. That must be cool, huh? Yeah, yeah. So when they're up boiling around and everything, you'd I, suggest maybe giving that a shot? Uh, I would say like a small metal cold sniper is the way to go, but I've seen them eat surface sirens, but it, it's not very often for whatever reason. Um, what's your favorite island to fish? <clears throat> Clemente. How come? Why? Uh, you catch sea bass, yellowtail, uh Earlier last year, there was bluefin in the lee of the island. Um, it's just variety. Way Bass in, fishing's good. Way more options. Yeah. yeah. Rock fishing's not as good as Sand Nick, but um, there's still good places to fish rock fish at Clemente. Yeah. All around, it's a good island to fish. Catalina, probably because you get a lot of local boat traffic there, mm-hmm. right? So you kind of edge away from that, unless it's really biting full speed there. Uh, when I was a deckhand on the Sport King, probably, shoot, I was in freshman or sophomore in high school, a while from now. It was during that El Nino is the best I'll probably ever see Catalina. We're what catching was biting? Full speed yellows? Full speed yellowtail. Well, smaller we, yellows? Right? Yeah, smaller yellows, but, but we, still. we had like 100 to 150 every day for like three months. Wow. What year was that? 2014 or 15. Uh-huh. Yeah. Those are amazing traps, huh? Oh, it was it was unbelievable fishing. It was insane, but I don't think I'll ever see it like that again. Oh, you never know. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. You know, it's funny that a guy that's twenty three years old is like you're an old timer talking about. <laughs> and and it was you've been doing this so long as it was, a kid. It was like seven or eight years ago, I think. Mm-hmm. That, but it's a while ago now. Well, if I were to look into my crystal ball, I would say you're going to see that again someday, just because. Some of the stuff that I saw back in the 70s that I said I'll never see again, I've seen mm-hmm. several times, and I thought I never would. In fact, part of the reason I never got, went and got a captain's license was because fishing was so crappy in the Santa Monica Bay for a few years that I was like, there's no way, there's no way this is going to sustain itself. This is freaking BS, man. And I didn't, wasn't smart enough to know that it's cycle, cyclical. And that's all this was. In fact, this old guy, Ray Greenwood, who ran the bay boat, told me, cycles, dude, just calm down. You're going to see it all come back. And, you know, then he was right. You know, you saw it come back. It was great. Steve? Yeah, there's a bunch of uh, questions trickling here. Jeff is asking, what is the best island for calico fishing, in your opinion, Mark? The 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 best island for calico fishing? I would say uh, Clemente. Clemente is the best island. I would agree. Uh, my dad says back when back in the day, Santa Barbara used to be the best oh. SBI, but yeah, I know now exactly it's a whole another story. As Santa Barbara's not that good for it's not that great. Overfished or what? It's um, a small little island. It's a so. tiny island. Yeah. yeah, and they they put the wood to them back in the day there. So yeah. I'm sure that has. I'm sure that was it. before half the island was a closure. Now, oh, yeah, now the, there's a big part of the south. Place. South Kelp's a yeah. really good area and it's closed now. Yeah, yeah Clemente's great back there, China, China Point, and there's mm-hmm. so many different areas. Yeah. How's that middle of the back of Clemente, Eel, like that? Eel is Point? That, yeah, is that That's area? a really fishy area. Mm-hmm. It's very rocky and kelpy. Yeah. 
but I like fishing back there. Great. Tony Bean is asking, what about Humboldt squid? When and where do you fish for them? Yeah, where are those things, Tony? Good question. <laughs> I miss those things. They're fun to catch. Uh, hopefully we don't see them. <laughs> <laughs> Will you say that because they you, just the wipe out everything? Eat yeah. everything and yeah. anything. Like what? Sand bass? Sand bass. That's probably part of the contribution to not that great sand bass fishing. But I don't know. It's probably a cycle. Who knows? And, and for those of you who don't know, and Tony does know, Humboldt squid, I mean, they get up to 60 pounds and bigger. So they have voracious appetites, and they literally are just swimming around looking for anything to get their grimy tentacles on and eat. And so uh, on the one hand, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. On the other hand, there's, there's like Jules Verne, you know. It's like a kind of cool to see those things. So I know what you're talking about. And then dude is asking, if I catch a rock for fish from January through March from the jetty, the surf, can I keep it? I would, the, the, the reg, based on the regulations, I would say no, right? I mean, from January to March, rock fishing is closed, period. I don't think, I don't think it matters where you catch Fishing with Noel has something to say. I've met him surf fishing and saw him down at Big Fish Bait and Tackle. Noel, it's great to have you here with us tonight. So it looks like you can... Based I think off Noel, of the shore? somebody told me that, or Noel told me that, or where did I? Did we have a spear fisherman in here? And I interviewed somebody recently. Who was that? Yeah, um, we did have a spear. The guy, yeah, Paul. Paul. Yeah, Paul. With yeah, the, but he caught the big sea, uh, right. big sea bass. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I would say, uh, I, Noel, I think knows what he's talking about, but you can check that. But I, I think you can. I'm not sure about that. How would fishing game know if you're driving home and they stop you? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. That's a really good because I would contact fishing game and ask them. <laughs> that would be your safest bet. And then uh, Rob's fishing channel is asking, uh, we have if we have some charters this year, where can he book? Yeah, you can book with me, Rob. Thank you so much for asking. Steve, can you put the phone number in there, or is yeah. that or um, and, and I'm going to give it to you. And Steve can type it, so it's 657-227-6459. Just send me a text, and I'll send you the entire list, Rob. I'd be happy to do that. Um, we start out in April up there on board the Endeavor with Tucker. Um, that trip is almost sold out. And then I believe the next trip after that is the Amigo. We've got some trips down in San Diego on the Malahini. Um, we've got some trips on the Pride. So... If you just send a text to that, and I've already gotten a ton of texts here on my phone. Even Steve letting me play with my phone tonight. He didn't take it away. Um, I'll send you after tonight's show or first thing in the morning, I'll send you out a list. And then we can book you up and get you all taken care of. And right now, I just need your name. We can take care of a deposit later. Um, but if you want to, you know, you're sure you want to go on a trip, I can book you in there and we can take care of that. More than, more than happy to do that. Steve. And then JS is asking, will the Amigo be kite fishing for, uh, or will they be kite fishing on the June 15th trip with Phil? Unless for some reason we're fishing bluefin, I would say no. Okay. Yeah, hopefully we're going to be catching limits of white sea bass those two days and yellows and rockfish and everything else along with it. That's what we're hoping for. And then Pumpkin Jones is chiming in and he's saying that uh, you can actually catch rockfish from the surf. Um, it's, that law only applies to uh, boat fishing, so so I guess you can keep rockfish if you're if you're catching them from the surf during the closure time for boats. Yeah, that, pumpkin. I think you're absolutely right. However, like Steve says, if a fishing wildlife guy came up to you in your car, which I've had that happen to me before, yeah. um, it's rare, but it. it it can be done. Right. Yeah. They can pull you over if they see, if you're in a pickup truck, they see fishing rods sticking out the back, a big cooler full of fish. Yeah. They, they may stop you. And if, if, you know, there's no way to prove that you caught that rockfish, it, it'd be a tricky situation. You know where that happened to me once? And I don't, we had to explain our way out of it. We were in the Sierras for the opener. And I was with the guys from the Mans in Our Fishing Club. You talked about it in that episode. Yeah, and coming back, I, I took some guy's limit of fish, and then a fishing game guy pulled us over in the parking lot, and I had an over limit. So I had to like, hey, wait a minute, sir. You know, and I had to have the guy come down. And Anyway. Oh. 
Uh, Nick is asking, do you like fishing squid on lead heads or single dropper loops for sea bass? It uh, depends. Um, sometimes they're high up in the water column. Sometimes they're on the bottom. Just uh, I'd have both setups ready to go. And then Yeah, that's what I was, I was actually going to mention that. A lot of guys will actually, like if you're fishing off of a private boat where having multiple rods out is not a big deal. I know a lot you can't do that on a sport boat. But if you're on a private boat, a lot of guys will put a, you know, like you mentioned, a white jig with tipping it with squid, put it in the rod holder, and yeah. you can do the light lead head. That way you're kind of covering the whole water column uh, when you're fishing for sea bass there. Um, JS is asking, why doesn't the live fish, why doesn't the bait receiver sell greenback max? Does, do you guys know? You um, should know that. Your dad's okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's one of the owners of the bait company. Um, usually they, they have them. Uh, they're kind of mixed in with everything, I, right? My yeah, they're mixed in. My uh, best uh, answer to that is call the barge and have the kids on the barge snag you some mackerel. Oh, they'll do. Will they do that? Yeah, they're making some extra. Yeah, products, they're right? not doing anything. They should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, I mean, they are doing something, but they're selling bait. But yeah. there's a lot of time where they're... If there's some downtime, they could... If there's some downtime in the middle of the summer, it'd be hard. Do you know the phone number to the receiver? I don't. By, by, okay, we'll figure that channel out. It's 11. it's online. Yeah, yeah, on you the get channel, yeah if you're on, on the water, you can reach them on channel 11 usually. Yes. Um, that, that's all I got. If you have any more questions, we're getting ready to wrap up here pretty soon. But any more questions, please fire them in here. You guys have been fantastic tonight. No doubt about that. Mark, um, taking a look uh, just at so far your career in this business, how many years do you anticipate doing this? Are you th planning on being in this for the long run? Are you going to be 60, 70 years old someday? And uh, a proud landing owner and a proud... I hope so. That's the plan. Yeah. Do you feel like your dad is proud of you for what you've accomplished? Yeah. Because I know yeah. the answer to that. I yeah, mean, I, I think, can see I think it. he's... He's yeah. proud. I try my hardest to. Yeah, you're a great kid. I got kid. Big, big shoes to fill. <laughs> yeah, you're a great kid, and, and you work hard at this. And like you said, that pressure you put on yourself, um, that's good, and it's uh, it can get to be too much, man. I hope you don't do that. I, I hope you realize that all you can do is your best, and, and, and that's it, right? Yeah. yeah. Does it get a little crazy, though, sometimes when you can't get a bite? Oh, it's, it's it was, frustrating. So when we were at Santa Barbara Island that night, and we had the squid and everything, and the, I'm not the kind of guy who's like, what the hell's going on here? You know, I'm not. You know that. But did you feel pressure? I, I always feel pressure. Uh -huh. No no matter who's on the boat or, or what, what, their what charter is. it is, uh, I always feel the pressure to catch fish. Yeah. You can't always catch fish. That's Sometimes it's just fish don't bite that's that's absolutely true i was just gonna say i think that's a trait of a good captain i mean if a captain doesn't feel pressure to, that's true. to satisfy his customers and i mean he's not doing a good job yeah you're right you're right yeah um rob's fishing channel is asking can you rank the fishing landings in california uh, <laughs> southern california uh, just based off i guess how productive they are with fish you know, fish counts he's asking if you could rate them uh, from San Diego, no, you get yourself in real Beach, trouble here Channel tonight. <laughs> that's, that's a biased answer. Yeah, the best. You better put twenty, 20 seconds, seconds. Yeah. at the top. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough question, yeah. uh, Rob. Um, I'm sure it really it, depends on what you're targeting, but for the most part, I think that everyone kind of special. In my opinion, everyone has their kind of specialty and what they focus on and and i don't know if rob's and i'm not going to make any comment about this either except that we're very happy here at 22nd street but i think that the criteria for that should be customer service yeah and if and you're looking for where you can find the best customer we've, service. we've had multiple guys on the show that where they talk about they fish on this well-known boat you know and then they end up not they end up catching a, a lot a ton of fish just like that boat's reputation holds but the crew is terrible, and they'll never fish on it again. Right. So it, it's just like like you just said. It really depends on customer service. It really does. And even, I mean, then you get the double whammy. You don't catch any fish, and the crew sucks. Then you're really out. You know what I mean? Right. So it's it, when I go on a boat, we were on the Amiga, and we didn't catch a whole lot because we were shellacked by the weather that one trip. I walked over there happy, 
people were saying, when's the next trip? Everybody was happy because of the way these guys treat everybody. And the, and the food was good. And the stuff that you can control, the food, being courteous, being helpful, all that stuff, if you can take care of that, you got it nailed, right? You just need a couple fish to bite after that. Yep, exactly. Customer service is definitely the most important thing. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, are we ready to do the, oh, we have one more question out there? Anybody else? No, I think that's it for now. Okay, Mark, it's been really great to have you here. I can't wait. I'm telling you, June 15th is going to be a great trip, man. Just write it down. We're going to catch limits of sea bass, limits of albacore, <laughs> limits of bluefin. Uh, we're just going to smash them. All right, let's do our uh, tackle grab. I'll do that right now. We'll see who out there is going to be the winner. If it's Sal Buchert, I'm going to spin again. Just kidding. <laughs> and our winner is a guy by the name of Nick Ramirez. Nick, I don't know if you're walking, but you are our winner tonight. Steve, you can show that if you want or just take my word for it. Nick Ramirez, and you said what, like 50 bucks worth of stuff? Yeah, he's going to be taking home some Pro Marnahi jigs, a jig bag, and then some of that Iser line that uh, Wendy donated to us last week. Excellent. I want to thank our sponsors one more time again before we say goodbye to Mark. A few of our sponsors, of course, 22nd Street Landing, Daiwa, our rod and reel sponsor, Opsin, Fluorocarbon, Fish Taco, Chronicle Magazine, the Malahini down there out of H&M Landing, Tucker McCombs and Ventura Sport Fishing. You can reach them at 805-676-3474. Remember to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. And we would love it if you gave us a five-star review on Spotify or any of the other venues that you can find our podcast on. Subscribe to our channel on on uh, YouTube. Um, to all of you who contributed tonight with great, great, great questions, we thank you so much. You're the reason why we've been able to get close to 1 million views in our first year. You and guys like this guy right here. Mark, pleasure. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for being here, and can't wait to fish on the Amigo this year. Looking forward to it. All right. Mark Paisano Jr., everybody, thank you. Kim, Fish, Steve, thank you so much, and we'll see you again with another show next Tuesday night. Take care, everybody.